I'm coming to you this morning to talk to you about the faith zone. The faith zone. The faith zone is a, is a limbo land, if you will. It's a place that a lot of us are in right now and, and find ourselves in. And some of us have been in this place for years and you're wondering, am I ever going to get to the next level? The faith zone. What is the faith zone? It's simply this. It's, it's the, the place between declaration and manifestation. It's the place between maybe that proclamation of God's promises. You've gotten a word from God. You've read his word. You see what his word promises us. But you just haven't seen it manifest in your life. And you find yourself just kind of floating out there in a limbo land, if you will. That's where some of you are today. You're waiting for something to break or to happen that just finally ushers you into that next season where the promises of God that you've been holding on to for years or months finally to manifest. They finally become real in your life. I mean, think about the Israelites. They were in this limbo land for 40 years. They, they were out there. They, had, they were heading to the promised land. Uh, this incredible land flowing with milk and honey. This land where God was going to take them to establish their, their new home in life. And it would be just this glorious experience. And, and yet for 40 years they wandered in the desert. And some of you are wandering in your desert. Some of you are in the wilderness place, if you will. And you're just waiting for this time to, to manifest. And your faith is being shaken. You are questioning your faith. You are questioning, is God even real? Did God even hear my prayer? Does God even care about where I'm at and what I'm going through right now? We've all had those times. And we've all had those days. I don't know about a five-minute message, but I'm going to do my best to get done in time. Amen. Will you pray with me for just a moment as we let this begin to sink in and get into the word father for the next few moments God as we get into your word God let me speak life into this body let your anointing rest heavy on the message that you've laid on my heart to speak life into this body to speak faith into this body let them leave here today God though they may still be in the faith zone when they walk out this doors their faith will be raised to the next level but I believe though that today is a day where you're going to usher some of them into their new season. I believe today is going to be a day where they begin to see the manifestation of your promise in your word. And I declare that and speak that over this body. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. Romans chapter 4, if you'll be turning there this morning, has a powerful passage of scripture that... Every time I read it, I, you could almost just come up with a whole other sermon based off of what you're reading out there. The, the, the Bible is alive, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? You can read a passage one time and you come back and read it again. And because of where you are in life, maybe, you just get a whole other thing out of it. I, I, love this, I love this passage in Romans chapter 4. Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right, now look, I am, I've been Pentecostal all my life. I know how Pentecostal church should be. So you got you to gotta holler at me, shout at me every now and then, wave a hanky or something. Let me know you're getting this, okay? The more you do that, typically the quicker I preach and we just get done faster too. So just a little secret. Anyway, chapter 4 of Romans starting in verse, uh, verse 16. Therefore, the promise. Let me hear you say the promise. Come on. The promise comes by faith. You get that? You need to underline it, highlight it, circle it. The promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. And may be guaranteed. We like that word, don't we? Guaranteed. You don't buy nothing today without some kind of guarantee on it, right? Come on. 
You're not going to just go throw your money on some cheap stuff. You want that guarantee that it's going to work or you're going to get it fixed or replaced. But this promise that it may be by grace, it may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but those who are also of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And as it is written, I have made. Listen to the tense of that. I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Some of you have some things that are not and are ready to see them as they were. Come on. They, he says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. There's a key right there. In hope believed. And so became the father of many nations. And just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief. He's not saying the unbelief wasn't there, but he didn't waver through it. He didn't stay there. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This morning, I want you to leave here fully persuaded that this book will come to fruition. The promises of God are yes and amen and are about to come to fruition in your life. But the question is, how? What do I need to do? What needs to be taking place to get me to that place of manifestation where what I see in God's word is a promise from God to begin to happen in my life? I'm glad you asked. I really only have one point to my sermon. You can ask Phil. I emailed it to him this week. But we've got to really break down what this point is. And to, and to get to that place, there's something, some foundational things you need to understand. There's two foundational beliefs when it comes to a saving faith, okay? A saving faith. Number one, while one is saved through faith alone, we believe that faith in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was God's son, that he died for our sins, that he rose again, he's now sitting in the right hand of the Father, and that he's the only way to our Father. It's that faith. That there has to be a faith in him, but it doesn't just stop at faith, okay? There has to be that faith alone, but that faith alone, or that faith that saves is not alone. It's got to be accompanied by something. James told us that faith without deeds is what? Come on, dead. That's right. Faith without deeds is dead. There's a lot of people that claim to have a faith and believe that there's a Jesus or whatever, but they really live a dead faith. If you were to go look at that passage in James, you'll see that there are people that they don't act on it. Their life is not changed. They may believe that there's a God, but they don't live as though that there's a God. James goes on to even talk about a demonic faith. Not just a dead faith. He goes to the next stage and says, there's a lot of people that have a life of a demonic faith. They confess a lot of things and believe, but their life never changes. And as a matter of fact, he says, even the demons believe that there's God. They and shudder. We have a lot of atheist Christians walking around that are messing the name of the church up because they're, they, they, they live a life that, that is not separated from the world. They live a life that has not been set apart and called out and become holy in God's sight through His grace. And they just continue living and abusing grace and abusing faith. There's a lack of belief of the, uh, and a fear of God and who God really is and a reverent fear of Him. So there has to be something that goes with our faith. Paul in Galatians says, faith expressing itself through love. See, it's for, it, is, it is our love for and our obedience to the Savior, who is also our Lord. Everybody wants a Savior, but nobody wants a Lord. And that's a whole other message. Because a Lord begins to, that's Lordship. He takes ruler, rulership of your life. Everybody wants to be saved from the fire, but nobody wants to do the hard work down here. Come on. It's getting quiet. Not just, let me, help me out. So, in other words, because of my faith, my actions show that I truly believe and I truly have received. And so what that means is not only did I believe, but I actually repented. Repented, again, is not just that I'm sorry for what I did. 
I'm sorry that I got caught. There's a lot of us that live a life that we're sorry that we got caught more than we're sorry that we actually did the sin. And so repent means there has to be an action. Repent literally means to turn and go the other way. There has to be action behind your faith or else you have a dead faith. So you've got to understand that, 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 that this foundational belief of a saved faith. And two, faith is not only being saved from condemnation, but it's also being saved for a holy, intimate relationship with God. He desires the fellowship with us. He was just loving that a few moments ago when you were just standing there with your hands held high, just worshiping at him and calling on him. He was loving that. He was drinking that in just as a dad loves to come home and have his kid just come running to him and wrap their arms around him. I've got three kids, 12, 11, and then four. And I tell you what, you know, my older kids, they still love on me and stuff, but there's nothing like those little ones. My four-year, I don't care if I just went out to the garage and did something for a few minutes and come back in the door. It was, to her, it was like I've been gone for an eternity, and she runs and tackles me at the door every time and just grabs her arms around my little leg, just, Daddy! I, I, mean, I drink that. I love that. How much more do you think our heavenly dad who created us loves those moments? That is longing for that moment to be with our heavenly dad again. Longing for those moments to be in our prayer closet. Longing for those moments to just begin to pray and worship and to exalt him. He longs for those moments. So he desires to have this fellowship in time with us. Fellowship in the works that Christ has created for us in advance to do. Ephesians 2.10 tells you that Christ has some things lined up for you before you were even formed. So he created these opportunities in advance for you to do. This prayer walk that you're going to do around the community, I, I hope that we're able to be in town and be a part of it. I want to be there. This is, this is our home church when we're not traveling and stuff. I want to be a part of that because I believe that is a work, though, that God created an opportunity before you were even born because he knew that you would be in the place that you are in this life for that moment. And I believe there will be divine appointments on that walk. And you're going to get to share your faith. You're going to get to share your testimony. It's going to be a powerful time. But back to the message. In life, there are many things that will, that will zap our faith. There are many things, many physical circumstances in our life that will cause us to question God. At various times, they will make you question whether God hears you, whether he's real, I mean, it, it just, it, it, we've been there. I've been there. You've been there. If you haven't been there, get ready. You'll probably be there. But we have to exercise our faith. If there's a lack of exercise in your faith, you become apathetic in your relationship with God. Some of you haven't gone to the next level because you've become apathetic in your relationship, in your faith. This morning, singing that song, Break Every Chain. Normally when I'm singing that song and worshiping to it, I'm saying, God, break the chains of addiction. God, break the chains of this, da, da, da. And this morning, I found myself, God, break the chains of apathetic faith. You don't have to be a heathen to still disrupt what God's wanting to do. God has incredible plans for your life, but if Satan can keep you busy doing everything else and not what God wants you to do, then he's won. You don't have to be a drug dealer. You don't have to be this bad person that we see on TV and, and, and walk around horny. No, you just got to be apathetic in your faith. And you're not doing what God's called you to do. And you're hindering the work of the kingdom. I'm praying God break those chains. Nobody can steal what God has done in your life. They can debate your theology, but they can't take what God has done for you personally. Some of you need to get out of focusing on the current circumstances and begin to breathe life. Into those circumstances. My one point this morning. Are you ready for this? To see your miracle become a reality. Don't deny the facts of life. But infuse them with faith. To see the miracle that you are hanging on to. The miracle of God's word. The promise of God's word. Become a reality in your life. Then number one. You can't deny the facts of life. But you must infuse them with faith. What are you talking about? Let's get into it. The fact was in this story, Abraham was 100 years old. The fact was, Sarah was 90 and never had a baby. Come on, and all my senior adults in the room are just, mm, God, really, no, that's okay. <laughs> but God had given them a promise. God had promised them that they would give birth. And not only would he just be a father, but he would be a father Nations. The man's a hundred years old. 
That's the fact. You can't deny the fact. Sarah's 90. Womb's dead. That sounds like something on the cover of the National Enquirer. 90 year old woman gives birth to baby. You don't make this kind of stuff up. It's ridiculous. We would look at that and go, that's so stupid. Like, who would even buy that, right? Who would even, like, that's, man, they were really, they were really desperate for some work to go on this. You wouldn't even, but yet it's in the Word of God. The infallible Word of God. It's a story that happened. So the facts are, he's 100, she's 90, never had a baby. But yet, he never wavered in his faith that said, he operated in faith, God gave him a word, and sometimes that word is all that you're going to have, but that's all that you need to hang on to. That word from God. You know God gave you a word. You know God showed you something. He spoke into your life. God's word is the word of God, and this is the word of God as well. You have this word, and you have the word that he's spoken into your life that you need to hang on to. You can't deny the facts of your reality. You can't, you can't deny the fact that, 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 man, my life is going crazy right now. Everything, But God has said, I will have peace. The facts are the facts. And you need to understand that. Chances are, for us, somebody that age having a baby, not going to happen. But if there's a word, you better hang on to that word. You need to know the facts. Why? Because facts determine your current reality. Facts determine where you are right now in life. It's your circumstances. It's where you're you're at. It's like a GPS. If you want to get somewhere, you got to know where you are first before that GPS is going to be able to lay out a route for you to get to where your destination is. So you've got to accept the current reality of where you are. My current reality is I'm out of shape. Y'all ain't got to tell me nothing. <laughs> I'm out of shape, man. These camps wore me out. Miss Yulana and her kitchen team was too good. I did not lose weight in camp. I gained weight. I come out of these camps, I gained weight. I got to accept the current reality of where I'm at in order to get to the destination of where I want to be, which is in shape. Now, I ain't got to be on the cover of no muscle magazine. Wouldn't be a bad thing, but I ain't got to get there. I just want to be in shape. But I've got to accept the fact that I'm out of shape. And in order to get there, that means there are things that I've got to do to get from here to there. There's some things that are going to have to change in my life. Some of you want to claim a promise that God gave you or a promise in God's word. But you're not wanting to change how you live. You're not wanting to change the lifestyle that you're living. You're wanting God to just bless you and drop stuff in your lap. You're wanting God to bless your finances. Yet you're blowing your money every week on lottery tickets and everything else. You can't manage your money. You're wanting God to, to bless you with kids that behave. Yet you're constantly hollering at them. And you're never home and you're never pouring into their life. I mean, something has got to to give in order for you to claim the promise that God wants to give you. Something has got to change in your life. And you've got to accept the current facts that things, if they stay the same, aren't going to change. That's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over but expecting a different outcome. There are a lot of churches that do that. I, I, I was just sharing with Brother Lamb this morning. Man, I love this church. I feel it's a piece of heaven. There's such a diverse crowd here. This is a little bit of what heaven's going to be like when we're worshiping around the throne together. There's such a diverse crowd here, young and old, uh, multi-ethnic, racial. I mean, just everything. You see all kinds of different flavors through the crowd. I love it. This is a little bit of what heaven's going to be like. There are churches there that will love to experience this, but they refuse to change what they're doing. They refuse to do the work that it takes to get to this point. This church didn't just start this way. Pastor LaVon, for the last 14 years along with it, has been developing teams and leaders and pouring into people and been led by God. It took a lot of change, and we don't like that word, do we? I pastored three and a half years. You ain't got to tell me nothing. I know you don't like it. <laughs> Lie to me. Oh, yeah, we're good with change. That's the only thing that's inevitable in, 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 in life, right? It's change. <laughs> Boy, we hate it. You've got to change some things. You've got to accept where you are, and you've got to change some things in your life in order to get to that next place and begin to claim these promises. Uh, you'll, you'll never get where you're going. You've got to be honest with yourself, and that is so hard. Sometimes, though, you need to stop and look in that God mirror in front of you or in this God mirror right here and read this word and say, does my life align up with that word? Because if it's not, then no wonder I'm not getting the promises that he's declared me. 
Verse 18 said, just as it had been said to him. See, there's power in the spoken word. Abraham couldn't hope in the facts. The facts were he's 100 years old. He's like, if I'm living off facts, I'm not having any kids. But I know the word that had been said to me. And I'm clinging to that hope. It was in that in hope he believed and so became. You've got to hang on that and you've got to begin to infuse the facts with the faith of the word of God. He had to stand on God's word. Some of you have got to go back to standing on the rock. We used to sing the, uh, the old song, standing on the rock. Uh, what was that? What's the name of that song? Solid rock I stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Because it's on Christ, the solid rock I stand. And all other ground is sinking sand. The ground that this world is trying to stand on is shifting and sinking sand. Look at the standards. They change every day. Look at the morals. They're changing every day. The, 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 this world would just soon tell you there is no absolute truth. As soon as you say there's no absolute truth, you are no longer standing on the rock of God's word, but you are standing on sinking sand. And we've got to get back to Christ, the rock in which we stand. There is an absolute truth, an unchanging truth, a word that has never been changed. It is still the same. He's still the same God yesterday, today, and will be forever. And we've got to accept that fact and begin to stand on his word and align our life off of his word. And then things will begin to change the way they need to so that we can claim the promise that he's got us. You can't argue with the facts. I get that. But you can begin to speak truth to the facts. See, there's a difference. You can look at the facts and say, I'll never, I can't. You can look at the facts that you're in, and a lot of you, the fact is, you're in a pretty dire strait in your marriage. The fact is, a lot of you are in some dire straits in your finances or in your health. That's the fact, but you can't just look at the fact. You need to then go to the Word and say, what does God's Word say about this? What do I need to do to change the, the, the circumstances and begin to infuse my situation, my facts, with the faith of God? The fact is... You got money issues today, but you can be blessed tomorrow by Jehovah uh, Rapha. I mean, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. The fact is, some of you are sick in your body today. You've been given a diagnosis that you want to hear. But the truth is, tomorrow you can be healed in Jesus' name by Jehovah Rapha. The fact is, your marriage is struggling. It's tore apart. You fight all the time. You don't want to talk to each other. You just soon be ships passing in the night. But the reality is... Those facts infused by the faith of God, you can have the best marriage you've ever had in your life starting tomorrow. The fact is, John 17, 17 says, your word is truth. And when you get the truth, the truth can change the facts. And some of you have facts that need to be changed this morning. The facts remain, but the truth can change the facts. The fact is you're sick, but the truth says by his stripes you are healed. The fact is you're limited on your own. We all have limitations. We've got physical limitations, and we feel like we've got financial limitations. And because of our limitations, we say, I can't. Somebody says, you need to, and I can't. I, hey, can you do this? No, I can't. God's called some of you to go on a mission field. I can't afford that. God's trying to do something. You keep saying, I can't. But the truth is, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, somebody needs to praise him for that fact right there. You've got to begin to speak truth into the facts. Begin to speak the word of God. Speak life. Your words have power. They have life and death power, according to my Bible. Quit speaking death into your situation. You're living in this faith zone. You're questioning God, wondering where he's at. And he's up there going, dude, I've already said, I've already got it wrote out. The answer is already there. I'm just waiting on you to begin to believe that it's there and operate like it's there. You've got to speak truth into your situation. Romans 4.21 from the Living Bible says it this way. He was completely sure. That God was well able to do anything that he had promised. He was fully, fully persuaded that God, not, he, God isn't just able. He is more than able to do what he promised. God is not going to make a promise that he can't keep. You can't show me in history where he's done it. 
All through his word, the promise that was there, when the people decided to change their life, when they decided to become the righteousness of God, when they decided to align their life and their life's habits by the word of God, then they began to step into the promised land that they had for them. It took a whole generation of those Israelites to die because of their lack of faith is what kept them out. They originally sent the spies in the land. Go check the land out. Ten of the twelve spies come back going, oh, it's horrible. I mean, yeah, there's great fruit. Yeah, it's the land of milk and honey. Yeah, it would be awesome to live there, but there's giants in the land. There's walls. There's fortified cities there. And they looked at all the negative things that they had to face. And it wasn't but two, Joshua and Caleb, that said, yeah, I hear that, but God said. Some of you need to get back to what God said in his word. And begin to operate on that level. So it took the whole generation of those other guys to die off before they were able to even go into the promised land. Don't do that to your situation. God wants to bless you right now. I'm not here to give you some, you know, prosperity message. But I'm here to bring the truth of the word to you. The truth is God wants to bless you. He is your heavenly dad. And just as a dad wants to bless uh, his kids, I love blessing my kids. So how much more, the Bible says, does our Father in heaven want to bless us with the gifts of the Spirit? He wants you to operate in power. He wants you to live a life that makes people go, I want what they've got. They want to see something different in you. They want to see you go through the circumstances that you're in. They want to see you march through the wilderness that you're in and still come out praising God because there's something different about you than the others that just have the Christian bumper sticker on their car. But yet every time they get in a traffic jam, they're too busy honking their horn and flipping a bird at the guy. (laughs) See it all the time. Got their Christian t-shirt on and they're up there cussing the lady out behind the counter because they didn't get service the way they should have or won't write a tip out because they didn't like how something was done. Or write a God bless you on there. Don't make me sick. I'll tell you what. That's why people look down on the church today. See, Abraham knew that God was more than able to do He was fully persuaded, so he began praising God before it ever happened. He began thanking God for what was to come in his life. And that's where some of you are at today. You don't have any praise in you because you want to see the results first. That's why we have a generation of kids that don't want to work anymore. So much has been given to them. Everybody now thinks everything is entitled to them. It is their right to have a cell phone. It is their right. And I could... mm. Hallelujah. Lord, help me. Help me. Again, if you look at the life of Abraham, he, start, he didn't start out as Abraham, did he? He started out as Abram. You know what Abram means? Abram means exalted father. But God said, no, nope, I'm calling you Abraham. You know what Abraham means? Abraham means the father of a multitude. He got a name change. And then he got the promise because he spoke faith He hung on to that word. He realized that if God said it, then whether I believe it or not, it's true. That's what settles it. God said it. That settles it. The fact is one thing, but God and his truth says another. If God's already called you one thing, then you need to start acting that thing. You need to start living in that way. Start living in what God has spoken over you. A faith-filled confession is not lying. You've got to believe it. You've got to receive it. Get it deep down in your spirit. Verse 18 said, Abraham in hope believed and so became. He had faith-filled confessions. I will be a father of a multitude. God said it. I don't know how he's going to do it. Don't know when he's going to do it. Any time now, God, because I'm not getting any younger. That's the fact. And he became. Pilate asked Jesus in his trial, are you a king? Jesus said yes. But listen, at that moment, that was a faith-filled confession. Because at that moment, he wasn't sitting on a throne. That moment, he didn't have a kingly crown. He didn't look anything like a king. But here we are over 2,000 years later, and we're worshiping him as the king of kings and the lord of lords. The fact was Caesar was the king, but the truth was Jesus was the king. The fact is, some of you are struggling this morning. The fact is, some of you are fretting over the current circumstances and situations that you're sitting in right now. But the truth is, God has a better plan. 
for your life and for your family. If I could have the worship team come back. You can't fret over the facts. But what you've got to do is you've got to let your confession line up with the word. Now listen, understand that everything, and James, again, we'll go back and line this up. Everything that you ask for and things that you believe has got to line up with the word of God. The word that's been spoken over you does it line up with the word of God. Everything has to come back to this absolute truth. So maybe some of you need to stop and do some soul searching again. You need to pray about where I'm at and is that word really for me? Did it come from God? Does it line up with God's word? And if you can find that it does, then you need to start living it out. Verse 16 in that passage, the one that I opened with, it says, therefore, the promises, the promises, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Do you know that you're Abraham's offspring? That's me and that's you. Because we're children of the Most High God. See, in salvation and justification and righteousness that God provides, it came by perfect obedience to the law. Now, we understand we can't live by the law. Matter of fact, he did away with the old law. And we now live under the new covenant. And we live by grace. This amazing thing called grace. This amazing thing that many people try and take advantage of. No one could live and obey that law perfectly, but grace came through Jesus. Since it comes as a gift of grace received by faith, salvation this morning can be had by anyone who would respond and receive it. See, some of you, you're ready to claim your promise. Some of you are ready to see your life change. You're tired of going through the same thing over and over. You're tired of facing the same battles that it seems like every day. You're tired of not having a joy in your heart. And maybe some of you once had that joy, but you've lost it. But I'm declaring this morning that God's going to restore to you the joy of your salvation. Would you stand with me this morning? See, God mercifully forgives our sins. I'm so thankful that He does. He forgives and He imparts divine grace. He imparts His Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. When you pray a prayer of salvation asking Jesus to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit moves in and takes up residence. And when the Holy Spirit moves in, that's when things begin to change. It's through the Holy Spirit that you begin to look at things differently. It's through the working of the Holy Spirit that you begin to think about things a little bit differently. See, He begins to change you from the inside out. Too many people are hung up on what it looks like on the outside. But my Bible says He is faithful to complete the work that He has started in me. There's a work going on inside of you. Right now, there's a work going on inside all of you. For some of you, your heart is beating, and there's a deep longing in your soul that will only be filled by the Holy Spirit, and that's because you are needing to receive Jesus as not just a Savior, but allow Him to be Lord of your life. On every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. You're ready to see your circumstances change. He's desiring to regenerate your life and to make you his children. This morning, if that deep longing is in you, and you need Jesus to be back the center of your life, and you need to receive him as Lord and Savior, would you slip your hand up this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
God wants to do something awesome in you. This morning, you need God to restore the joy of your salvation. You've been living in the faith zone for so long. And you begin to question your faith and you begin to question God. And you need God to remind you of that word to restore your salvation and that joy. Will you slip your hand up? Thank you. Awesome. 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 Just as this song said, he's continuing. He's, he is making all things new. And he is setting you free. And my Bible says that he who the sun sets free will be free indeed. This morning, I'm going to ask for you to take another step of faith. And it's just you practicing your faith, because if you don't start putting action to your faith, then you're going to stay just where you are. But if you raised your hand, I want you to step out and acknowledge that you need God to change some circumstances in your situation. If you raised your hand, would you come quickly? We have prayer teams that want to pray with you. Thank you. Come on down. They're already breaking the ice. You're in a safe environment. You're in a safe place. God wants to change your circumstance. He wants to heal your marriage. He wants to heal your finances. He wants to heal your relationship with Him. Heal your relationship with others. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm letting the Holy Spirit marinate some of this on you. Some of you, you're wanting God to do something in your life, but there's unforgiveness in your heart. Listen, when you live in unforgiveness, man, God can't honor His Word. God can't provide the promises that you're wanting if there's unforgiveness in your heart. There's broken relationships that need to be taken care of. You know His Word. His Word is yes and amen. Where you're at. I don't want you to pray for these, but I want you to begin to pray over your situation. Where's your faith been shaken at? Where's it weak at? And I want you to begin to pray life into it. Speak God's truth 